Uh, so first, we'll just go over a quick overview of Forum 1, what Forum 1 is. Uh, we are a digital agency that partners with influential organizations to craft solutions for the world's most pressing problems. Uh, we've been around since 1996. We exclusively do open source work. Uh, we've done over 2,000 successful projects, uh, 750 influential clients, and we are 100% mission driven. We work uh, primarily with nonprofits and with government, and uh, that's the type of work that we're doing every day. Some of the capabilities that we have here at Forum One, we do digital strategy, we have a design group, we do development, of course, uh, we do a lot of work with data and uh, support. And today we're going to be focusing on the data aspect um, with Kurt, uh, the CTO of Form 1, and with Laura Castillo-Page Castillo of AMC. Here are uh, some of the clients that we have at Form 1. Uh, you'll see that it ranges across huge foundations like the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the Gates Foundation, uh, big organizations like the American Red Cross, um, and others. And now, without further ado, uh, I will pass it along to Kurt to get the webinar started. Thanks, folks. Okay, Kurt, you should be the presenter, and you can take it away. All right. I need to share my screen in order to do so. Ned, kindly direct me towards the right button. <laughs> Please, no problem. I don't have presenter mode. Oh. <clears throat> While we're going ahead and getting my computer into presenter mode, I'll introduce myself. Um, I'm the Chief Technology Officer at Form 1 Communications. I've been with Form 1 for about 15 years, and I've been working with NGOs and the web uh, for all of that time. Um, and I'm really excited for today's conversation. It's a topic that I think is a really timely and important one for uh, issue-focused organizations. And I'm joined by Laura, Laura Kostiuk. Um, she's worked with Forum One recently on a on a digital report. She has been with AAMC for for ten years. See for, for ten years, where she leads it. Ten years, where she leads it. Ten years, where she leads it. Okay, where she leads a team of thirty staff that are focused on policy research and program development uh, for diversity in in uh, physician workforce, among some other portfolios that she'll talk about later. Um, she uh, recently took up marathoning <laughs> and has run uh, a handful of marathon, marathons just in the last two years since since her youngest got into into um, elementary school. Uh, into elementary school. So thanks so much for joining us. Um, I think this will be a good topic. Um, so let's dive right in. So there's our friendly faces, um, for those of you on the phone. Uh, here's what we're going to cover today. Um, we're going to talk generally about the, uh, the digital world and the competitive landscape that most organizations like yours, presumably, um, are in when trying to uh, attain and retain the attention of influencers and decision makers um, with data, uh, among other things. Um, we see some three keys that organizations like yours need to focus on in, in using their, their data to present and persuade, um, they need to distribute it, and you need to have effective management of it. So we're going to talk about those three um, elements of, of data. Uh, and we're going to hear from Laura about a, a case study for the um, Diversity in Physician Workforce Facts and Figures report, which was recently launched as a, as a, a fully digital uh, interactive report. Um, we're hoping to have um, about 15 minutes or so for sharing from you all on the phone and questions and, and answers, so please cue those up on the sidebar as we go through. Um, without further ado, your organization is likely in the business of providing research and insights that are aimed at making decision makers' decisions smarter. That comes in the form of uh, insights and analysis that your teams and your colleagues are hard at work producing within the organizations that you work for uh, every day. Um, 
and this means lots of things today for your organization in order to support um, informed decision making. Um, what are we doing? What are you guys doing um, offline to make that happen? Um, in our experience, most of you are conducting rigorous uh, research and analysis, everything from survey to uh, original scientific research, uh, depending upon the, the sector and the fields with which you're focused. Um, you could take any of those forms. Peer review, connections and networking, um, lots of uh, elbow grease and dialogue through the events and symposiums, traditional marketing and outreach. Um, it takes a lot to reach uh, influencers and to influence those folks, and you guys are, are in the trenches every day. But what are, what are we doing digitally today to, um, to, to reach and uh, influence influencers? This is a bit of an oversimplification, but this is what we see from a lot of the organizations that we work with. Um, the go-to vehicle for distributing all of the rich insights and analysis that can lead to world-changing, smarter decisions are more often than not bundled and packaged and distributed via reports. Those reports are the anchor of all of those other activities that are happening, the dialogue, the symposium, symposiums, and the uh, peer review, and the networking. Um, but at the end of the day, digitally, very often, um, the result is a PDF. Um, this is a pixelated button taken from uh, a customer's website to underscore the point. We also know that um, this is from a, a World Bank uh, report, somewhat ironically, that was distributed on their website via PDF, um, that looked at the number of downloads of their PDF reports uh, for a four-year period from 2008 to 2012. Now, we know that lots of things go into making a, a report get downloaded other than just the report itself. So we can take this graph with a bit of a grain of salt, but it's somewhat disturbing to see that by and large, the majority of reports published within this period by arguably one of the world's most influential uh, research groups on um, development were never downloaded even a single time. Um, and it, and we, we think that this has pretty big, um, uh, big implications. Now, reports and data aren't necessarily the same thing, but we do know that a lot of um, um, influence um, and attention gathering today has data at the heart of it. Most of the reports and the outputs that you produce as an organization um, have embedded graphs and charts and data sets and tables. Um, and uh, the, the data today is, is increasingly important for, um, for, for media attention, for public attention, for policy decisions, uh, it's the data point and the, and the key trends uh, that folks look for in this attention-scarce world. Uh, in fact, those reports that you guys produce, um, which may range from anywhere from a two-page policy brief to a, an 80-page um, um, in-depth report, are facing um, a really interesting mix of online competitors who are, who are after influencers themselves. Uh, there's been a, close to half a billion dollars in investment in new media uh, slash new journalism uh, online outlets from Quartz to Vox.com in the recent years who are tuning themselves to, to natively deliver insights and analysis to influencers. Um, in fact, this is, this is um, Atlantic Monthly's review. This is Atlantic Monthly's three pillars, strategic pillars, as they uh, sought to um, revamp themselves in the new digital age. Um, Atlantic Monthly has been around since 1857, so it's not, um, it's not a, a small undertaking. And if, if you read these, I think that they probably resonate with you. They're, they're, they need to, to actively manage the shift from print to digital. Um, they wanted to digitally for everything. And most importantly here, these, these folks are, are seeking to focus on decision makers and influential people just like you are. So we can learn from them. We're wa we can watch a half a billion dollars worth of investment online to see what they're doing. Um, and what they're doing is relying a lot on data, and they're presenting data in very explanatory ways. They're making it a centerpiece of almost every article that they're um, I exposing. Um, they're, they're focusing on ideas and making it really clear and easy for people to uh, jump in and absorb them. Um, uh, and they're, they're attracting large audiences. 
this is interesting. We think for for NGOs like you because it's not just a um, it's not just a model for how to present certain types of data. Um, these are also great channels through which you guys can redistribute your content. These can be great partners. Um, <clears throat> so this context of a really hyper competitive landscape landscape for insights and analysis and, and news. Um, means a couple of different things if you're thinking about trying to communicate with your data online. Um, you're probably thinking, um, you know, how should my data and reports be presented now in light of this? Um, how, can I, how can I do this affordably and sustainably? I know what it takes to, to produce one beautiful report online, but how do I do this for, for the, the 15, the 10, the 5 the, a month that we produce as an organization? And what do I need to do as a communications professional to work with the IT and program, res program staff to make this more seamless? Um, and, and how can I get started? Um, so we're going to uh, dig in to three things that we think you, you can focus on through some examples uh, and best practices. Um, first, looking at how we can present and persuade data. Uh, second, distribute and manage with a brief interlude for a great case study from Laura in a moment. Um, we look at these three pillars through um, uh, a lens that we know is connected. Um, in fact, when we're looking at data within your reports, in most cases, <coughs> the end product, the report, or the online data explorer, or the online digital report, is has this purpose of, of um, uh, presenting and persuading. This is where the rubber meets the road, and you're attempting to, to influence um, and make smarter decisions, right? Um, but there's a lot of things that happen with the data prior to it getting to that point. Um, it needs to be managed and analyzed by your program teams in, internally, um, and it also needs to be distributed in other channels along the way to that final package presentation. So we're going to focus on these as we go through. Um, so looking at presenting and persuading, um, we know that to effectively um, reach the audiences online, data has different uh, usefulnesses to different types of individuals. Um, and depending upon who you're trying to reach, you may focus on one area rather than another, or one tactic rather than another. Um, we would argue that in any case, you should be looking at all four of these key ways. If we look on the right, the examples from uh, infographics, um, what we would call light visual briefings into detailed uh, visualizations all the way down to rich data explorers as a package that every one of your data products should be looking to put together in some way, shape, or form, right? So your policy online should include all four of these things. Uh, any one of your initiatives should have outputs around short infographics that are atomic. Um, it should have medium density um, presentation, story-driven visual briefs, long-form digital reports, um, and it should also have uh, deep data analysis. Um, so let's look at each one of those for some examples through the lens of a story first on um, the lightweight ones, the infographics. Um, the State Health Access Data Assistance Center, which is an organization funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, um, started with a PDF, um, a report on state-level trends and employer-sponsored health insurance to distribute their data. Uh, in addition to releasing their report, they also knew that they wanted to find some, some key elements of it, expose it to um, the media, expose it to interested and concerned citizens in ways that were um, um, bite-sized and enticing to lead people to the fuller report. This is a quote from David McCandless, the author of Information is Beautiful, and he equates uh, a, a well thought out simple infographic um, to coming across a clearing in a jungle. When you're trying to communicate really complicated things, a visualization can really hone the message of the story. So back to Shadak, they um, worked to identify not just a lead story, um, which in this case was um, how um, steadily, how health insurance through work was steadily declining nationwide before the Affordable Care Act, but they also crafted uh, secondary stories, in this case, um, young adults staying on their parents' insurance that they wanted to expose. Um, and then they also created uh, individualized local infographics that could be distributed and marketed to local media outlets. Um, as a result, 
the report itself, just, just by creating very simple infographics of key points that were carefully um, curated, they're able to have a very large uptick in media attention. Um, and their data points themselves are the things that led to the stories, so the anchors of stories. The, the regional um, angle of customizable data was really successful in this particular case, picking up um, media coverage in lots and lots of, of um, local markets. Um, so this notion of, of an infographic as um, something that is by itself a really valuable nugget that exists outside of your report is pretty important. Um, Quartz, for those of you who are familiar with Quartz.com, the, um, there's a quote from their lead editor who says that, that Quartz's team, their staff writers, when they're trying to find insightful stories to promote, look for what they call the atomic. Um, this is the single, uh, the sing a single fact that's interesting that they can use to shape a story around. And so by taking apart your reports and the individual um, graphs and charts inside them and putting them into package um, atoms, you can reach uh, these folks much more effectively. Um, and a great example, um, this is one where I wanted to show a live one. So my, um, let's see. Um, yeah, I'll do that. So you guys, get, if you want to click through uh, to this or just, or just Google how scientists engage the public, the Pew Research Center is doing an excellent job of making their data um, available in this, at this atomic level within the reports. Um, for every single one of their survey questions, uh, which you can see here on the screenshot on the right, you can click through into um, uh, a single page that enables every single question or survey and the statistical results of that question to be shared at, a, at an item level. Um, so I can share the individual report or the individual data point. Um, yeah, I'm gonna, I, I'll tweet it out. Okay, I, these other examples I wanted to show. I'm gonna go ahead and, uh, The next level of, um, of um, packaging of your data that's effective is uh, what we would call the story-driven or lightweight. This is for the folks that are uh, likely to dig a bit more, but it's taking a handful of, of your key data points and telling a story with them in an interactive way online. This is the County Health Calculator. It's again funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and it enables uh, it's, it's to tell the story of the relationship between health, education, uh, sorry, education, um, income, and health. And it's based upon research data um, that was collected by a University of Wisconsin program um, called countyhealthrankings.org. Uh, so what this does is it literally tells the story. It's not a comprehensive data explorer. It's really a, a select data set um, that enables users to manipulate some really simple levers to literally tell the story of their data of the data. So in this case in Virginia, um, if I were to um, uh, if 11 percent more people attended some college and 8 percent more had some higher income, then I might expect to see um, uh, a limit a savings of 378 million dollars in diabetes costs, for example, 5,000 lives saved. Um, I can actually see the data. I can read more about the um, the process that they use to, to make these um, these uh, analyses. Um, you, the, the third packaging, um, the third pillar, or the, the third way in which we can package up our data um, within our report and more compellingly present them online. Uh, is with the full text reports with integrated data. Um, this is a screenshot from the Center for Global Development who has um, recently begun producing all of their uh, policy briefs in full text online, including lightweight uh, interactives that are built into their um, e each report. Uh, this is one of their marquee reports called the um, um, Commitment to Development Index that measures uh, first world countries 
um, how, they, how they rate on a number of factors um, related to their helping the um, developing world um, develop. Um, and things like trade and aid and finance and migration. Um, Ned will tweet the link to this one uh, as well, so the um, so you guys can see the live the live version. Um, and one of the things that we're starting to see that's interesting by them publishing these in full text as opposed to the full text HTML online with the interactive graphics is that we're finding that. Um, Across the board, the full text versions are read far more frequently than the PDFs, particularly over time. So this chart shows for 20 different reports in the last um, uh, year and a half or so that were published by CGD that had both a PDF version available, a full text version available, and what we would call a historical landing page, where it's really just download the PDF as, as, a, as a button along with the summary of the, of the article. What you can see is that the number of unique views, visitors, for, for each of these reports, for the most part, is um, significantly more for the full text than it is for the landing pages or the PDFs. Um, in fact, it's about five to one. For every one person who downloaded the PDF, about five folks visited the full text uh, versions, which is exciting. Um, and then the last way to really um, present your data and persuade your data online is for the uh, audience segment that's most closely associated with your um, with your topic and your data, and that is through rich data explorers, um, so that folks can come to their own conclusions um, with the data that your team has made available. They can slice, they can dice, they can select and filter, um, changing ra date ranges depending upon the data that you have available. Um, this is the green growth knowledge platform and it enables you to um, select um, multiple countries for comparison purposes as well as multiple indicators around um, environmental measures um, so that researchers can um, download and slice and dice the data themselves. So again, when we're looking at presenting and persuading, uh, it really matters that you have um, from the simplest itemized package infographics through the, the narrative visual briefings to um, full text, um, full length reports, um, all the way down to uh, rich visualizations for deep data sets. Um, and ultimately, we should be thinking that we want to make um, uh, print the byproduct. All of these things can be printed at the end of the day. Um, from their digital format, but if you start with print as your endpoint, you're going to miss a lot of the benefits of digital, which are the interactive data, downloadable data, video maps, and the like. Um, so now we're going to jump over to uh, Laura and talk about the AMC Diversity and Physician Workforce Report. Hi, everyone. Um, so what I'd like to do is tell you a little bit about who the AMC is and also talk about why we made this leap from a classic PDF report to one that's online and interactive. Um, a little bit about the AAMC, we represent, we're an association that represents the 141 USMD granting medical schools, as well as 17 Canadian medical schools. Uh, we also represent about 83,000 medical students, 110,000 resident physicians, and about 128,000 faculty members. Um, we also represent about 400 teaching hospitals and about nearly 90 academic scientific societies. So that's a little bit about who we are um, as an association. Um, specifically, I work in the Diversity Policy and Programs Unit, and uh, we have three areas of work that we cover. Uh, one is organizational capacity building, and that portfolio is really helping our medical schools and teaching hospitals advance diversity and inclusion. We do that through training opportunities, through assistance with strategic planning, with assistance with climate and culture assessment, uh, and with data. And I'm going to show you an example of a report um, that we developed as part of this portfolio. We also have our human capital portfolio, and that really focuses on cultivating the skills and behaviors of individuals along the medical continuum, such as students, faculty, researchers. 
And lastly, our public health initiatives portfolio, which is really about the infusion of public health concepts into the medical education curriculum. So that's uh, uh, making sure that our graduates understand social determinants of health, that they understand health disparities. So those are our three areas of work. And naturally, uh, data, the numbers, are core to the work that we do. Um, we're constantly following applicants, matriculants, graduates, faculty, and the physician workforce. They're all key to the work that we do. And so I want to share a little bit about the history of this report that we decided to move into a different format, which is our facts and figures data series. Uh, we have been producing this report since the 1980s, uh, pretty much in a similar format year after year. Um, one topic was on diversity in the physician workforce, and then we'd alternate topics to looking at diversity in medical education, the students, the faculty, the graduates. Um, but we decided, you know, it was time to make a change and to produce a different report, uh, to reach larger audiences, to reach multiple stakeholders, and, and that's what I want to talk about, the goals of this new version of the report. So obviously, uh, given our mission and our commitment to diversity and inclusion, one of the things we wanted to accomplish with this new report is to continue to advance diversity and inclusion, um, but specifically to help our members that we represent uh, build a compelling case. Uh, when they're communicating with leaders, when they're communicating with policymakers, um, we're always tracking the numbers and looking at the impact we're having. We wanted to serve multiple stakeholders. Kurt talked about how we have to, we might have to reach different audiences and might have to um, d deliver our mes message differently to different folks. But in this case, we needed to reach faculty members, administrators, students, policymakers. So we needed to create something that would be. Um, uh, something that uh, would reach all of these different types of, of constituents, uh, stakeholders. We also wanted to maintain what's been working with the report. Like I mentioned earlier, we've been producing this report since the 80s, so there were some really good pieces we wanted to keep. There were some classic data points that people have always relied on, that they always come to and always following, but we wanted to enhance them. We wanted to uh, do more interesting stuff with the data that we had. We also uh, wanted to move incrementally. We didn't just want to produce the report that was just so super complicated to navigate, but we wanted to make sure that our different constituents would still be able to understand the report, that it still had a similar uh, feel to the previous uh, printed reports. So we worked closely with Forum 1 to make sure that when folks came to the new report, they would still recognize it, that they didn't feel that it was just completely different, and they could still go to the data that they were, um, that they relied on, but um, even that they could potentially do more with that data. And we wanted to cover more content with less. Um, typically, this, these reports, when they were PDFs, would range from anywhere from 80 to 150 pages. With this new site we created that Kurt's going to walk you through, we were able to provide even more data in six simple sections. Um, so you can do a lot more with one figure when it's online than you could when it's printed as a PDF. So I think we're going to share uh, the report with you now, and then I'll come back and talk about results. This was open on the other computer. Let me go ahead and open it now. Um, make sure I have the right URL. Why did it not pop up? It's uh. Can you the URL? Um, I know how to get it from the agency site. Yeah. Uh, it's AAMC Diversity Facts and Figures dot org. Um, yeah. So, so Laura just just talk through the goals for this report and one of the key things I think that's important is that um, when we talk about full rich online interactives and reports uh, a lot of things that jump to the mind particularly for um, folks in the communications and digital strategy sectors are, are um, you know, New York Times interactive pieces and 
a very story driven um, long form content. Um, it was really important for AMC that this not lose the feel of a, of a serious and um, important um, report. Um, and so one thing to note is that the report itself is its own um, site. It can be linked to obviously from the website, but the report um, is standing outside the distractions of your normal website or, or um, you know, the wrapper and the navigation and the, and the clutter. And it's really just focused on um, the report itself. It gives us new ways to, to navigate and get into it. Um, it makes simple use of um, key infographics that can be shared and picked up and distributed, um, key pull quotes, but it still feels very much like a report that they wanted to do that's, that's aimed tar targeted at um, um, their, their core audiences that are used to the report as a report. Um, some of the things that they were able to do um, within the report with the data, um, as Laura was mentioning, is that um, we, can, we can present online the data in ways that you simply can't do in a PDF making use of um, space saving things so that I can explore certain data sets um, in interactive ways uh, that would be not possible to show in, in uh, your printed version of the report. Um, um, data tables that can be downloaded directly from the report, sorted um, and presented easily, um, change the way in which they're presented. Um, the report itself, again, it's 80 pages of facts and figures. Um, that was a first step in um, moving slowly from the printed centric model into a, um, uh, a digital and interactive version, um, which uh, Laura's going to share a little bit about some of the, what they learned and some of the successes that they have. Um, let me just find, there's one other, there's some certain things in, here we go. Um, one of these, I want to say table. Oh. I was looking for you should show the map. Which one? The map. Oh, I think this, uh, yeah. Again, so all of the data tables and charts in here are interactive. They can also be printed, downloaded, um, and the data behind them can be downloaded as well. Um, so the, all of, every one of the tables and charts um, that are uh, available, obviously, in the printed version are represented here in a slightly more interactive way. Um, so that's a, a quick walkthrough of the, of the report itself online. Um, Laura? So um, obviously we want um, the media to pay attention to these issues and we were pleased to see that we've been picked up by the media and here are a couple of um, snapshots of some of the, um, the um, conversation that has been happening on the report. Um, it, and I think it, it's different from when we typically would produce the, the PDF, we would sort of see more in terms of researchers citing it and focusing on the numbers, and maybe we get a, a few um, folks from the media talking about it. But I think that in its different format, we're getting uh, different types of attention uh, on these issues, which we're very pleased with. Um, I also want to share some of the feedback we, we've gotten directly from folks um, in the field, or at least our, our members that we represent. Um, we've heard that it's simple to navigate and to understand. Uh, people still, some of the folks who still want to print a report and want to hold that piece of paper in their hands are pleased that they're able to print it and have that information. But they were very pleased uh, with the fact that they could go to this and have access to this information at any time in any any type of device. So that was uh, one of the biggest uh, uh, comments we constantly hear from folks about the report. Um, they were also pleased with the fact that they could just uh, use the figures in, in presentations. Obviously, they, they cite the report, um, which in the past they would contact us. We'd have to recreate it for them. And now they can just go and, and, and use it, uh, download it directly from the site. 
And uh, from researchers, they were pleased to see that they have now Excel sheets. So if they wanted to do further analysis, they could do that from the report. Uh, while in the past, they would have to contact us and we'd have to give them an Excel spreadsheet or they'd have to enter the information from the printed version onto Excel. Uh, so th that's some of the feedback we've received. Internally, um, we're seeing changes happening at the AAMC. I think it's uh, uh, helped us uh, Think about other publications we're working on internally and figure out how we want to move them in this direction. Um, so where we weren't necessarily having a conversation, we are now talking about these issues and how to really move our, our publications to being online and interactive and, and much more interesting. And then in terms of our next report, we're nicely set up for the next report, which will be on um, students, faculty, and graduates. And, uh, because we now have the platform, and so we'll be launching that report next year. Um, so I think it, it, it was more investment in time and energy and resources in the beginning, but I think our future reports will be able to crank out faster. Um, and of course, you know, if anything's ever wrong with the report, you can easily go in and fix it versus when you print the report um, and then you have a little typo. So I think uh, moving forward, it'll make it easier for us to produce these reports and, and get them out there faster to folks. Awesome. Um, so we've talked a lot about uh, the presentation and persuasion side, really kind of report centric because that's at the, at the core of a lot of, of the work that our the customers that we're focused on are working on. But there are two other pillars to this. And so in, in order to, uh, beyond your reports, there's some things that we feel like are best practices for distributing your data to um, policy audiences that can't be overlooked. So quickly, um, there are some de facto things uh, on the web today that the way you, you talk about your organization online, everybody knows if they want to find all your publications, they're going to go to slash publications, your blog slash blog. We would argue that data is important enough that um, not just your reports, but the data itself have a home within your um, organizational web presence. Um, and the things that it needs to have on it quickly, um, it should have a catalog of your key data sets. Um, this is a really uh, popular um, approach, particularly within federal agencies that are that are mandated um, to distribute their key data sets. Um, but the access to the raw data uh, is is important, particularly if you think back to that chart of audiences um, for the folks that are likely closest to your topic, the researchers um, uh, and analysts who are colleagues, perhaps or or peers of your own research staff. So making sure that there's a catalog of data sets available. Um, each, we, we talked about the atomic nature, the, the chunks and nuggets that are the visualizations themselves within a report. Your slash data section of your site should have a filterable um, catalog of these visualizations that can stand um, by themselves. Um, we're looking at um, the data page from uh, this consultative group to assist the poor. It's a World Bank program. We, we worked with, and their analysts happen to be using Tableau, which is a, a data analyst and visualization tool to create um, uh, infographics all the way to rich explorers that stand alone. So um, uh, in an ideal world, your slash data uh, catalogs each of the charts and graphs uh, at an atomic level so that, that people can find them by themselves and then lead them to the report. Um, you also uh, should be within within your uh, website able to manage data to some degree, like its content. From a communication standpoint, um, we're looking at the at the back end. This is just a quick screenshot of that CGAP website, um, but you can manage uh, data um, um, visualizations just like you could uh, a YouTube video in this case. And managing the uh, the associated data behind them uh, is as simple as uploading data sets in different formats. Um, this is a screenshot of the library of those of those data sets on that CGAP website um, so that content publishers could associate a visualization with a blog post so that it has a life outside of its um, report. Um, we also think that it's important that you not ignore uh, an emerging audience for policy data, and that's developers. Um, this is the homepage of um, CFPB's uh, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's um, HMDA uh, information site. Uh, and they've targeted developers directly because there's so much interest in the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act data um, out there. And they want to encourage folks to use this data to uh, help them 
in, in their efforts to raise awareness um, for what's happening in uh, home mortgages. Um, and in order to do that, they've created uh, APIs as um, uh, an entry point for developers to um, um, their most important data sets, in this case, the HMDA data. Um, so when you're thinking about distributing your policy data, um, we would certainly recommend these, these four things, the, the data set catalog at a minimum, um, an independent catalog of sorts that's filterable and sortable, sortable of the atomic visualizations, the actual um, data viz stories themselves, um, and making sure that you're not ignoring um, the developer community as a potential um, um, target audience uh, that may have um, um, use of APIs for key data sets. Um, Looking lastly at managing data so that you can become more efficient in producing all of these things above. I think that this is the one question that I get asked most frequently from our customers, which is, you know, that you're convinced that creating beautiful visualizations is a better way to reach audiences that you're, are your targets um, than ways that you have in the past, but it's time consuming and it's expensive and we produce lots and lots of resources. Uh, lots and lots of insights and analysis. So how do we start to do, scale this so that I can support all of my outputs in a way that's a bit more digitally native? Um, so to answer that question, um, there's a couple simple things to get you started. Um, first, we would say that your communications team need some coordination with systems and IT um, that allow you to start looking at how your data is managed at the program level uh, by the researchers, the tools they're using to analyze it and where they're storing it. Um, and you also need to, to begin the collaboration on what those outputs will look like earlier in a, in a report or a program's outputs life cycle than just waiting for it to come to communications, right? But all of this is really so that you can um, create consistent data structures and sources. So in the same way that your, your public website should have your key data sets available, your communications team should be able to communicate to your researchers um, and program staff, here's how we would like to have the data so that we can help create um, beautiful uh, data sources. So starting to put in place um, practices and policies that enable you to, uh, as a team, have access to consistently structured data, data sources. Um, that will lead to um, consistent ways of presenting the data and charts and graphs that will live across multiple reports, for example. These are um, graphs and charts that are, that are taken from three different um, courts.com articles today, um, just from their homepage, um, just scrolling through. And they use a simple tool, it's an open source tool based upon uh, a JavaScript graphing library that lets them create lightweight data visualizations to manipulate one or two variables consistently across all of their digital outputs. Um, so you want to be moving towards these um, tools that enable you to consistently embed these in your reports. Um, and ultimately, you want to get to the place where AMC is starting to get to, which is creating a template that really packages all of these things. Harkening back to the, um, the present and persuade um, um, key um, methods or tactics, you should be, as a communications team, saying, for our policy outputs, we need to have a templatized package. Here's how we do the routine outputs. Uh, it, should, but it should have consistent ways to do short infographics. It should have consistent ways to do medium, the long form digital reports, and for select key data sets, creating the, the data explorers. Um, um, so that the next time you're producing these, uh, it's, a, it's not as heavy a lift. Um, there's lots of different uh, tools and techniques, and we didn't really focus on those in, in this webinar. We wanted to, to look at some of the key principles, um, but we now have um, just time to sum up and take some questions. So uh, in, in summary, we really feel like if you're looking at data um, and how it can impact your, your efforts to attract um, and retain uh, influencers' attention, um, then you should be looking at it through three ways at your organization. You need to be packaging the presentation and persuasion to be making use of data um, in compelling ways. You also need to be looking about how you're distributing that data outside the purview of 
uh, your report to programs. Um, and ultimately, you need to be putting in place the processes, the skills, and tools to manage the data um, that makes it easier for you to scale this at your organization. Um, so, um, and this doesn't have to be a massive undertaking. You can start small, right? Um, a and C looked at a single key report and effectively uh, connected that data path, right, from managing um, to distributing to uh, presenting it uh, all in one report so that um, they can now take what worked from there um, in order to make the next production of their next report um, more feasible um, with less lift. So with that, um, we've got about 12 minutes for your um, questions and sharing. Great. Thanks, Kurt. Um, we've had a couple of questions come in already, but for those of you who would like to ask questions and haven't had a chance yet, please do use the uh, questions section on your sidebar. And you can also tweet at us as well. Um, here's a couple of questions that we've gotten. Uh, Lauren Green asks, um, can you speak to how collaboration involving key stakeholders plays into the process of creating an infographic? Yeah, yeah that's a great question. Um, I, I, this is Kurt. I would say that um, when we're talking about the key stakeholders, there's a couple, right? There's there's the analysts uh, and researchers themselves that are closest to the story, to the data. Um, there are the production folks that that have insight on um, what might be a compelling way to visually represent this stuff. Um, there's also presumably uh, policy, maybe even legal. <laughs> folks that are in it. So when you say stakeholders, there's a lot of them. Um, but I, I think the biggest thing would be um, if you, you know that you want to have a digital output for um, that product, regardless of how many stakeholders there are, your best bet is to make sure that you've got them at the table early in the process and that you're not waiting to tack on the digital project at the very end of the, of the, of the process. Hopefully that's a a decent answer to your question. Laura, do you have any perspective on that? I, no, I was just going to say that um, in, in, our, in my experience, we work closely with the 401 team with all our infographics. Given that this was a report on diversity, we wanted to make sure that all of our images of people were, could be reflective of anyone. So if you notice in the report, when we had an image of a nurse, it wasn't necessarily a female. Or um, we use um, bright colors to represent, you know, all the different uh, folks we were talking about. So it's we were just very cognizant of that, and we worked closely with the team to make sure that the infographics were also communicating, not just the, the data point next to it, but that it was also communicating a, a certain story or message. Um, um, a quick question here, Kurt, what is the open source data tool that was used in the Forbes.com example? Do you recall that one? Yeah, it was, it was, uh, Quartz, um, that's Q-U-A-R-T-Z. Right? Well, it wasn't. It was uh, Quartz.com, which is Q-Z.com, um, uh, not Forbes. I might have mispronounced. But that example was, um, it's called, uh, it has a strange name. It's an open source project that Quartz.com created. And you can find it by uh, Googling D3 Quartz visualizations. Um, I could... Um, I'll, I'll send, I'll send a, a, a direct uh, link to it, but it's an open source project. It's very simple. What it does is it takes, um, you cut and paste um, data um, that's in text format, CSV or just tab delimited, um, and then you can manipulate certain parameters, and it's one that their actual authors use to produce consistent charts and graphs, and it forces them to, to do smart titling and smart labeling, and it uses consistent colors and a decent presentation, and it also wraps the ability to share that individual um, infographic um, with like tweets and likes uh, and, and embeddable shares. Um, Great. Okay. Uh, here's another question from Yvonne. In terms of prioritization, are there specific things that are most important to focus on when transitioning to presenting data online? Things that are most important to get right first. Yeah. I, um, ha having worked on a, a couple of these or several of these with with our customers, I find that there's a um, there's a there's a gut instinct for uh, your organization to want to create the the, the big data explorer. Like I, I want to, you know, they're envisioning 
a tool that they can provide to their audiences that lets their audience discover their own insights within the data. Um, so this is kind of the rich data explorer example that we talked about earlier. Um, and my experience is that, that serves the narrowest audience. It's probably the one that's closest to engage and it can be useful to them. Um, but, but I would say the most important to focus on when transitioning to this is uh, the much simpler story. What's the, what's the one data key point within your, or what's the tweetable version of your report and what data best represents that and maybe just let them manipulate one or two variables or just start with the actual data infographic that really sells that, that salient point. Um, um, and over time, you'll start collecting those things, right? Uh, if you're doing that for each one of your reports, before you know it, you've got these nice bite-sized consumable data stories with companion. Um, um, so I, I look back at Pew, I think Pew Research does a really good job of this. They have the daily number. Um, every one of their survey questions is is its own little data point. So that would be that would be my advice on where to where to focus first. Great. Um, all right. Here's another question from Aaron. Are there key data management platforms that you recommend? Um, we've worked with a handful. Socrata is one that's really popular in government, um, particularly if you have lots of unrelated data sets that you want to easily let your actual program or research staff distribute. Um, so it's a good way of, of meeting the data catalog um, need. Um, so what, once, um, uh, th there's also um, open source tools in this arena. There's a project called CCAN, um, which, is, which, is, which is focused on the same thing, uh, creating a kind of catalog of data, um, uh, data sets that can be sorted and filtered and presented online as, as kind of like online spreadsheets. With also, they, it also provides you with an API. Um, there's another open source project that's related to CCAN called DCAN, uh, which we've also used, which is a Drupal-based um, way to manage um, data sets that you're kind of publicly exposing to folks. So those are three. Um, depending upon where you're starting in this data path, you may find that if, you're, if you have an anchor report that's the sim same type of data um, over time, that you might be just as well served um, creating um, uh, a kind of communication-centric data store that you're working with your programmers. We, we do the countyhealthrankings.org um, um, report year after year with, with um, RWJ and, and the University of Wisconsin. Um, and their researchers have their own SQL Server databases and their own, um, you know, SAS analysis and, and our platforms. Um, but we have a communication-centric database that powers all of the visualizations that we work to evolve with them. Great, thanks. Here's another one. Uh, can you articulate a little bit of your process as a designer about how these visuals come to life? Wait, let's see, which one was that one? Is that a different? Uh, oh. Yeah, that one came can through Twitter. Oh, a designer. Mm -hmm. um, I'm probably the wrong one to ask. <laughs> I'm, the, I'm, the, uh, I'm, the, I'm the techie guy. Um, I do know that um, the best results happen when you put the designer with the developer with the researcher analyst. Those three disciplines together collaborate to, to create the most effective ones. The, the program staff knows the story the most effectively, or, or they know the key levers that their audiences are seeking. Um, the designer brings um, really valuable insights on how to present it, uh, and the developer needs to be there to kind of help make sure it's achievable and feasible. Um, and I know Lord, when we were working with you guys, that's kind of what we did, chart by chart, with yeah. those three disciplines were kind of sitting with your team. Yeah, we spent a lot of time all three groups talking about these issues. At first, we felt like we couldn't communicate, but after the by the by the time we were halfway through the project, uh, we understood each other. Great. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Um, some folks have asked if the presentation will be made available. We'll send the slides around in an email afterwards. Um, if there are any other questions, please there's, do. There's send one them in through. here, which was. Um, uh, here we go. How does this change how you launch a report? to get maximum attention from different audiences compared to historically doing a briefing or something along those lines. Um, yeah, I, I want to reiterate here that, that um, we don't think that just visually producing your reports is going to really replace all of the hard work that it takes to do in the, in the offline world to, to, to attain and, and retain attention of the influencers. Um, um, so in fact, some of the examples that we showed, we work hand in hand with traditional PR firms 
a lot of the RWJ funded pro programs that we've worked on where we're producing the digital native visualizations or databases or websites. Um, the, there's a traditional PR firm that's, that's working on the same project with us to help craft those local angle stories that they're, they're using traditional outreach to media outlets to promote. Um, they're also anchoring their launch with a, a, an event um, that lets them highlight key points and brings together key folks. Um, so I, I don't think that really, it, it doesn't change those. Yeah. 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 Um, I think that it just serves as a way to, um, um, uh, to augment them. And we think that increasingly folks are going to come back to the digital product more frequently than they may come back to what historically would have been the, you know, the leave behind that was on the desk, um, right? So that, that it gives it a lot more um, tangible long-term value. Great. Okay. Well, I think that, that's all the questions that we have today. And it looks like we ended right on time, which is amazing. <laughs> there were a lot of slides there. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. I'm having to talk so fast through all those slides. I hope yeah. that it was useful, and um, we're happy to take any more questions that you guys have via email or Twitter. Or exactly. The, um, the email addresses and even uh, Kurt's phone number are there, so uh, make sure to ask any questions of the speakers that you like. Um, the slides and hopefully the recording will be available at the end of this, uh, so keep, uh, we'll keep you posted. We'll send you an email uh, with those details afterwards. Thanks so much, and have a great rest of your day.